Hello and welcome to another Facebook Live broadcast with MedStar Health. My name is Sarah Reidenauer and I'm joined today by three of our MedStar Georgetown University Hospital physicians who will be discussing symptoms, causes, diagnostic procedures, and medical management for gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, otherwise known as acid reflux. Um, today we have gastroenterologist Dr. John Carroll who will talk about medication treatments for GERD gastroenterologist Dr. Angela Nocerino, who will talk about es esophageal pH testing, surgeon Dr. Patrick Johnson, who will share surgical treatment options, and we're also joined by one of our patients, Malcolm Harkins, who was, was treated at MedStar Georgetown. So thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to be here. Um, before we begin our discussion, um, I want uh, to go around and have you all tell the viewers a little bit about yourselves and your expertise. Um, Dr. Carroll, can we start with you? Thank you, thank you Sarah. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist here at Georgetown, and we all sort of get little subspecialties, and I, I do endoscopic ultrasound for staging uh, cancers, and I, I do a lot of esophageal diseases, and I developed an interest in Barrett's esophagus and reflux and spent a lot of my time on uh, patients with reflux and the early cancer patients and trying to prevent surgery when we can. Great, thank you. Dr. Nasserino? Yeah, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Angelica Nasserino. I'm a gastroenterologist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Uh, just a little background um, on myself. I completed medical school at Georgetown and I did my residency in internal medicine and my fellowship in gastroenterology at Lenox Hill in New York. And I recently joined faculty at MedStar about a year ago, and I'm very excited to be back. Um, my special interests include disorders of neurogastroenterology and motility, and I focus on motility disorders that affect the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, and colon. Um, today, we will be mainly focusing on GERDs. So in regards to the workup of GERD and esophageal motility disorders, in my practice, I use endoflip, high-resolution esophageal manometry, and pH testing. Um, all of which we'll talk about later today. So thanks for having me, everyone. Great, yeah, thank you for being here. And Dr. Jackson? Uh, thanks, nice to meet everybody and thank you for organizing this. Uh, my name is Patrick Jackson. I am the Chief of General Surgery at Georgetown. And like Dr. Carroll was saying, uh, in, in academic medicine, a, a number of us tend to focus our areas. And so like Dr. Nosarino and Dr. Carroll have both been trained in gastroenterology as a whole, their focus of their practices tend to be towards what they were just talking about. My, uh, uh, I uh, trained in general surgery, um, went to Harvard undergrad, Columbia Medical School, then did all my training at Mass General in Boston before I came down here. I came down here 20 years ago and I've been at Georgetown ever since because I've I just love this place and I, I think we take great care of patients. The focus of my practice is minimally invasive using little incisions to fix problems. And most of that happens to be what we call foregut, which refers to the esophagus, the stomach. Uh, and so reflux disease or other diseases of that region is, are the most common operations that I do. Um, we do almost all of them through little incisions, minimally invasive, and, and we offer the wide variety from links, which is also known as magnetic sphincter augmentation, or, uh, and, and that's one way to fix it, and then for, fix for reflux disease. And there are also, we could do laparoscopic Nissen fundoplications, which is another way we'll talk about later to fix reflux by helping that valve and helping the anti-reflux barrier. That'll be all part of the discussion today. Exactly. Well, thank you guys. And Mal, welcome. We look forward to hearing your experience um, in a little bit after we ask the doctors a few questions, but thank you all for being here. Um, so we'll get into the questions now. First one, Dr. Carroll, what exactly is GERD or acid reflux? Acid reflux is, uh, you know, just like it sounds, you know, the, the normal, the, the keeping its, its normal stomach acid that splashes sort of backwards up into the esophagus. There's sort of a, oftentimes a general misperception that it's uh, quote unquote too much acid or, or but it's really the, the normal gastric acid the body makes for digestion, which is fine in the stomach and the stomach cells tolerate it. But when that same acid through either uh, just the, the, the valve at the top of the stomach, either being a little bit weak or defective or just relaxing more often, that acid splashes back up in the esophagus. And that, that is what we term reflux. And then what are some of the symptoms and causes that go with that? 
So the symptoms are, are really varied. The, the, you know, the classic symptom is pathognomonic. It's so, uh, it's one of these sort of clinical diagnoses and that what the patient describes is so specific for reflux, you can sort of make the diagnosis, just listen to them. And the typical one is the burning indigestion we'll describe in the chest, so radiating up to the throat. But that's just a certain portion of symptoms. So, you know, almost half of patients have no symptoms. And so one of the big parts of this is that when you see some in the office, you're talking with them, the presence or absence of symptoms does not tell you whether there is or isn't abnormal re reflux occurring. And so that's a big part of this. Um, patients can also experience what we call more atypical symptoms, and they can describe uh, throat symptoms, cough, throat clearing, uh, phlegm in the throat, or even things like swollen troubles and chest pain. So uh, the symptoms itself are very varied. Mm. Great, thank you. And Dr. Nasrina, how do you test and diagnose acid reflux? Yeah, so just like Dr. Cow Carol was saying, if patients have typical symptoms of GERD and then respond to antacid medications, it can be presumed that they have GERD. But in order to objectively diagnose GERD, um, we use endoscopy and pH testing. So um, first an endoscopy can be done, and this is a procedure that's done while the patient is sedated or is asleep. We take a scope with the camera, we go into their mouth, look down into their esophagus, into their stomach and small bowel. And we're looking basically at the esophagus. And if there's longstanding acid reflux um, from the stomach into the esophagus, that can cause inflammation in the esophagus called esophagitis. So if we see esophagitis, that's how we can diagnose GERD um, based on an endoscopy. Um, what we're also looking for is what's called Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus can be a, um, basically when the cells of the esophagus, the normal cells change because of constant acid reflux, the cells can become precancerous. And we'll talk about this later today as well. Um, and then if an endoscopy is completely normal, we don't see any um, esophagitis or any Barrett's esophagus, then we move on to pH testing to diagnose GERD. And then that was my next question. What is that esophageal pH testing? Yeah, so pH testing is basically an outpatient test that measures whether acid, whether acid is moving from your stomach into your esophagus. So we usually stop any antacid medications during this test in order to get a true sense of the amount of acid reflux. And with the pH testing, we can get a sense of how much of the day a person has acid reflux, what time of day, um, and we have two different types of pH testing that we use, wireless Bravo capsule and pH impedance cap, um, catheter, which we'll talk about as well. But in terms of pH testing, the types of patient we generally recommend um, getting these tests are, one, if a patient is complaining of symptoms of GERD, but their endoscopy is normal. Um, two, if a patient is complaining of GERD, they're on medications and they're still not improving their symptoms. Um, we also can consider pH testing in patients who have atypical symptoms such as cough or throat irritation. And again, we're not sure if that's truly related to acid reflux. Mm -hmm. um, and then always we do pH testing um, before we consider something invasive like an anti-reflux surgery. And again, this is just to confirm that there is true acid reflux going on okay. in their symptoms. Okay, thank you. And so then that kind of goes into my next question. You go through all these, you know, testing, but Dr. Jackson, how does someone know that they might need actual surgery for GERD? The operation for GERD uh, done uh, minimally invasively, uh, the what we call the surgical indications or the reason why somebody would get it is if they have reflux. Mm -hmm. uh, now, not everybody is going to choose to have an invasive procedure to fix their reflux because many of them will just be well managed by what we call proton pump inhibition, like the Prilosec, Nexium, Asifex, Protonics family. Those medications, as jo Dr. Carroll was saying, they, they, re they re will reduce the amount of acid in your stomach. They don't make the valve stronger. The problem here is the valve. It is not the acid in the stomach. The acid just happens to wash up because the valve isn't effective at stopping it from washing up. So those medications make it so you make less acid. Just as much stuff washes up when you take those medications as when you don't take those medications. Mm -hmm. So you still have reflux. You're just managing the symptoms, meaning you make it so it doesn't burn because you have less acid washing up. The stuff that's washing up is no longer acidic. 
So anybody with GERD can be considered for an operation, but the operation is, it's a procedure and it therefore involves incisions and anesthesia and recovery. And so for a lot of patients, they would consider just to be well managed by proton pump inhibition. Certainly anybody who has what we would call a complication of reflux disease should be considered immediately for an operation. Like, well, I mean, you wouldn't do the operation immediately, but it, it should be considered in that patient population. What are the complications of that disease? Well, they include um, anything from recurrent bronchitis, because as you can imagine, if you're upright and you have reflux, it just washes back down. But then as soon as you lie down to go to sleep, that stuff will wash up and could even get into your airway. It could damage your teeth. It could cause uh, uh, pharyngitis or difficulty in, in phonating. It changes to your voice. It can cause heartburn that is not well controlled. It can affect the bottom of the esophagus with that Barrett's esophagus that Dr. Nosorino was talking about. Anybody who's had some uh, issue with reflux where the reflux has caused some other problem should definitely be considered for reflux surgery. And any patient who wants to just be off medications, the 28 year old who doesn't want to take 60 years of medications to manage mm -hmm. their reflux, that's an adequate consideration. Anybody who is allergic to those medications, anybody who for their medications doesn't work. But certainly I agree with Dr. Nosorino, everybody who would be considered for anti-reflux surgery should have the diagnosis unequivocally confirmed by the GI team, because you, that way you don't do operations for people who wouldn't necessarily benefit from it. Right, right. And then can you talk about the um, different surgical treatment options? Uh, there are really two that stand out as by far the most effective. There are a number of others that people have tried, and there are some advocates out there for the others. But if you look at longer term studies and look at like the medical literature that looks at longer term studies, there are really two that stand out as incredibly effective. Uh, these are, uh, are done, uh, how do we know that they, that, that they work? Well, uh, in the studies, these have shown that at the one, two, five, 10 year mark, that their pH studies do not show acid exposure. That is the test, right? It's not whether or not, okay, your symptoms got a little bit better because if we do anything to this area, your symptoms may get a little bit better for a little while. Um, but the two that have been proven to solve the reflux barrier are what's called a laparoscopic, both of, the, both, both of them are through little incision, laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication, where you take the top of the stomach and wrap it around behind the esophagus and then sew it back to the esophagus and back to the stomach. So it sort of wraps all the way around the esophagus. And if the esophagus is in the middle, by wrapping all the way around, it sort of squeezes in on the esophagus just a little bit. It also, by wrapping it around behind, it cants the lower esophageal sphincter forward, making it harder to reflux backwards up into the esophagus. That's one. It's called the laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication. That's been around for 40 or 50 years. Then the other one has is, is, uh, been around for mm, seven to 10 years, and that's uh, a Lynx or a magnetic sphincter augmentation device, which is, it kind of looks like a, a Pandora bracelet. Uh, mm -hmm. for your esophagus. And it has little beads that each have, have uh, tiny little magnets in them. And so by the magnets, they squeeze down. And then your esophagus by swallowing opens the magnets up because the, the, the contraction of your esophagus is strong enough to open up the magnets and then sit into the stomach. But then the pressure inside the stomach is lower than the pressure of the magnets. And so the magnets really create a, a new sphincter. Both of those have been more than 90% effective when you look at studies over multiple years, including pH studies. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. You used a lot of big words in that explanation, <laughs> but thank you. You explained it really well. Um, so going back to um, management of GERD, uh, Dr. Carroll, what can patients do on a day-to-day -day basis to manage it? Um, I guess, you know, we've talked that there's medications, but is there anything else, you know, outside of that that they can do? Well, uh, I mean, yes and no. Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Patrick was saying, the, the reflux itself, they can do nothing about. And so the reflux is happening because their, their top gastric valve is either a bit lax, maybe a hernia there, it's an anatomic issue, which they can't change, um, or their valve may be competent, just relax more often. So for actually affect the reflux, they can really do nothing. 
there are things that can affect the symptoms. And, and, and so diet definitely plays a role. So there are some things. So diet plays a role. You know, there are certain foods. Again, it's not an acid problem per se. You know, again, many people have this, uh, uh, this sort of notion that they have too much acid, quote unquote, but it's really the, the normal stomach acid being the wrong place. And so there are certain foods that tend to make the valve relax more. And by minimizing those, you can sometimes, if symptoms are mild, control it that way. And, uh, you know, a, a quick look online, you know, rarely gets you these things, but it's, uh, you know, caffeine, alcohol, fatty foods, tomato-based foods, chocolate. It's not absolute, but for some people, if the symptoms are on the milder side, if they minimize those, that may be enough to control them. If the, we see have more severe symptoms where usually they've kind of blown past the dietary changes and they need something to surge your medication to control things. But there is a role for food in the uh, diet in the, the beginning, sort of more mild part of the symptoms. And then when you eat, uh, you know, a lot of times symptoms happen at nighttime. So avoid eating heavy meals before bed. When you lie down flat, it's much more easy for things to sort of reflux back up. And so avoiding eating before bed can be very helpful as well. Um, and then also elevate the heavier bed. Again, for the more mild symptoms, these things may all be adequate. And by, again, you know, minimizing certain foods that may make the valve relax a bit more, avoid eating prior to bed, elevating the head. For some people that may be enough to manage it. I, but, I, you know, I'll meet many people that sort of feel almost guilty as if, you know, they're doing all that you still feel badly. You know, it's really, it's your anatomy. It's not, you know, it's, it's really your stomach valve, which you uh, have no control over. And that's the real culprit with the diaphragm opening these different things, which um, people have no control over. So there is some limited effects, but, but not, not everything. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that can be frustrating for some people. Like you said, they feel like they're trying to do weight these things loss. and it's just not weight, weight loss too. I'm sorry. I meant weight loss. So weight loss. Okay. Is totally wrong. So I'm sorry. So minimizing weight, sometimes that could be enough to, to control symptoms for sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And then if, but you know, that stuff doesn't help, can you talk a little bit more about the medications and how those can help treat GERD? Yeah. And, and again, just to read what Dr. Jackson said, they, they, they don't affect the reflux itself. They just make what's coming up less irritating. And for many right. people, that's enough. Right. Um, um, and so I would say the majority of people that's effective and they, they can be comfortable and avoid an operation. Uh, and the people with either more severe symptoms or if they can't be on medications, don't want to be, then they're great surgical candidates. But, but there's sort of different stages. The over-the-counter antacids, they play a role. So if someone has immediate mild symptoms, things like Maalox, Mylanthotums, they just alkalinize what's in the esophagus and they work very quickly. And so for immediate relief, they, they definitely play a role. They don't last long. Uh, but but those those are helpful and also like Dr. Nostril said uh, diagnostically if someone has atypical symptoms chest pain or things and it gets better with tongue that's very helpful sort of diagnostically because all it's doing is alkalinizing what's in the esophagus if that doesn't last long enough for their symptoms then there are medications like Dr. Jackson mentioned that decrease the acid production and uh, a common question too is you know I need acid to digest food and well these medicines that they just tweak it down a bit so you can still digest food and, and, and uh, have normal stomach function. It just makes what's in the esophagus a bit less irritating. And the first class right. are things called H2 blockers and Pepsid is the primary name. For, and that's fine. For mild symptoms, that may be enough. For people, a lot of people we meet, they've kind of again, gone past that. And then there are the PPI medicines Dr. Jackson mentioned. And they just work on the acid producing pumps a bit more uh, competently and make the acid even a little bit you know, less acidic. And so it's just a quality of strength. Um, and, and for many people, it, it just taking those makes what's coming up less bothersome. And if they don't have complications, then that may be enough for them. Right, exactly, yeah. Um, thank you for explaining that. And Dr. Nostrino, can you talk about what is wireless uh, Bravo capsule? I think you mentioned that a little earlier. Um, how is the procedure done? How long does it take? That sort of thing. Yeah, of course. So there are two different types of pH testing that we offer um, to help objectively diagnose whether someone is having true GERD. So the wireless Bravo capsule is basically a small capsule that has a sensor on it. So it like the size of a coin. Um, and it's inserted during a sedated endoscopy. Um, and we insert this um, capsule in the line of the esophagus. And as soon as the capsule is attached to the esophagus, it's able to measure acid in your esophagus through the sensors. 
Um, after the endoscopy is performed, the patient is able to go home and this capsule sends measurements about acid reflux wirelessly um, to a small um, receiver recorder that the patient wears around their waist like a belt. Um, the patient shouldn't feel any pain with the insertion of this capsule on their esophagus. Um, and it usually stays on the esophagus for anywhere from two to three days. So we're able to get three days worth of information to see if you're having acid reflux. Um, eventually the capsule just falls off on its own and the patient just poops it out through a bowel movement. Um, but while it's sitting on the esophagus, again, we're able to get true information about acid reflux. And then every time that they have a symptom of what they think is um, heartburn or a cough or throat irritation, they press a button and we're able to see in real time if they're having a true acid reflux event during that study. Great, thank you. And then what is P, um, the pH impedance uh, study and how is that procedure done? And again, how long does that take too? Yeah, so pH impedance um, catheter study is basically a procedure that's done while the patient is completely awake. So unlike the wireless capsule, which is done during an endoscopy. Um, so we basically take a catheter, it almost kind of looks like this wire here, and it has sensors all along it. Um, the patient's awake, we numb the back of their nose, and we gently insert the catheter into their nose and it goes down into their esophagus. Um, and that catheter stays inside their esophagus for 24 hours. And during that time, we're able to get information about whether acid is moving from your, from your stomach up into your esophagus because this catheter with sensors is lining your entire esophagus. Um, what's also useful about this study um, is that it tells us not only if the reflux is acidic, but also if there's bile, it's also helpful um, in patients who have a lot of belching. Um, so we can kind of get a lot of information. Um, and this is a little different from the wireless Bravo, which is basically just one capsule with a sensor at the end of the esophagus. This test is spanning the entire um, esophagus. Got it. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. That sounds like it um, is a really useful tool with figuring, um, you know, the acid reflux out. Um, yeah. So, Dr. Carroll, we've talked about, you know, the different treatment options for GERD and, you know, all that, but what happens if GERD is not treated in a timely manner? Is there, you know, long-term effects or is it, you know, could it worsen over time or someone just kind of lives with these symptoms forever? Well, uh, a couple of things. So, so, I mean, in terms of forever, once you have reflux, it tends to be a chronic condition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once that stomach valve, whether it is loose or weak or uh, just relax more often. Once that pattern occurs, it tends to be forever, sort of for starters. And one of the, the funny things about the body is for the probably 90% of people with reflux, it's a maybe a nuisance um, that, you know, surge your medicine's help, but it's not a health risk. For the small percentage of people, it can lead to cancer. And that's one of the crazy things about this. And there are certain uh, groups that are more likely to develop precancer changes called Barrett's esophagus, like Dr. Nostrio mentioned, but it really remains a puzzle why some people develop and others don't. And when you sit with people in the office, by listening to their symptoms, there is no correlation with how they feel and, and what things look like inside. I mean, zero correlation. And so yeah. the majority of people we see who feel very uncomfortable, their esophagus looks totally normal. And it's mm -hmm. just, a, you know, um, other people may feel fine, and we may incidentally find all sorts of precancerous damage there. Uh, so, you know, for the majority of people, it's not a health risk and, uh, you know, there, there, there's no danger per se, but for some it is, and really it's age so in, in the sense that if you're in your 20s, 30s with heartburn, there really is no, for the most part, no risk. I mean, you can get sometimes what's called esophagitis and scarring, it's pretty uncommon. The main thing we worry about are these precancerous damage called Barrett's esophagus. But if the body is going to develop it, it'll pretty much develop it by the time you're 45 or 50 or so. And even if you have it, it's really, it's a moot point in your 40s. It becomes an issue in your 60s and 70s or so. So, um, you know, the question is, if it's going to cause damage, you want to sort of know about it by their 40s or 50s, so you can follow it going forward. If it hasn't caused it by then, it tends not to kind of go in forward. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a minute to pause and uh, tell our viewers if you're just now joining us, thank you for tuning in. Um, today I'm joined by gastroenterologist Dr. John Carroll and Dr. Angelica Nocerino. Um, I'm also joined by surgeon Dr. Patrick Johnson Jackson and our patient Mal Harkins, and we're discussing GERD, also known as acid reflux. 
We have a lot more to talk about. So stick around, give this a like, share the broadcast with your friends. And if you have any questions for our panel, you can ask them in the comments below. Um, so Mal, you've been very patient. Thank you for waiting while we've uh, you know, sorted some things out first with the doctors. Um, so let's talk about your story. First of all, what um, exactly were you diagnosed with? Well, um, Sarah, first I have to say that neither my family nor my students um, would ever believe that I was quiet for 25 minutes straight. <laughs> that alone that my doctors talk. Um, and please do not tell the, uh, my colleagues on the faculty at the Health Law Center at St. Louis University that I was that quiet because I've never been in a faculty meeting and been that quiet. So, <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Thank uh, you. <laughs> well, I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm thinking, uh, as Dr. Carroll in particular is talking, but uh, as Dr. Jackson and Dr. Nasserina were talking, I'm that guy. Um, it, you know, I am literally that guy. Uh, I was diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus about five years ago, uh, give or take, and uh, it was being monitored with uh, endoscopies every six months um, because um, there had been some cellular changes, but nothing that was really significant. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And, um, uh, you know, we all of a sudden weren't getting healthcare treatment. Uh, and the six month uh, period turned into a little over a year. And then at the end of last year, when they did the endoscopy, frankly, um, expecting that things were going, were, would have improved because they had been continuing to improve uh, and expecting that I was not going to need to continue with the endoscopies every six months, it turned out that there had been significant changes in my esophagus um, and high grade dysplasia. And, and at that point that something needed to be done. And so what exactly were your symptoms and you know, what caused you to seek care from um, SR Georgetown? Well, the, the, those are two different questions. The symptoms, um, I, I, I've been listening and, um, and when I hear people describe it as GERD, the way I experienced it, it has to be 30 years ago, at least maybe longer, was heartburn that got increasingly more severe. And initially I was doing what most people do, Tums and Rollades. In fact, yeah. I, I wish I bought stock in the company that makes those <laughs> products. Uh, but over the years I was treated with every uh, prescription or over the counter medication that was available. Uh, I can't even remember all of them. Someone asked me the other day and I, I couldn't come up with all of them. And eventually they stopped working and the heartburn was occurring regularly. Uh, several times a week. And sometimes it was severe enough that uh, I, had, I would get headaches and just feel physically debilitated. I never, never went as far as you were describing, Dr. Jackson, in terms of uh, aspiration or anything like that, but, but um, it was enough that it was interfering with life. Right. Um, and, um, and so, my uh, former uh, gastroenterologist, uh, now retired, uh, I, it never occurred to me. I mean, it's heartburn. You know, yeah. you, just, you think of it as heartburn. It right. happens. You don't yeah. think of it, it as a layperson as something that's going to go further than that. And when I mentioned it um, to Michael, he, um, you know, he looked at me like I was nuts and said, we got to do something about this and uh, started treating me with medication and monitoring it. And as I described, um, and um, uh, the medication controlled it at the end that what he prescribed controlled it. And, but as Dr. Carroll was suggesting, uh, when I went back in in November for the delayed six month checkup, um, I had no symptoms at all, in fact, I would have told you that uh, the medication was working great and nothing was happening. I, I was stunned. Uh, when I saw the pathology report on my chart, I thought they had the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I went back and checked all the patient identifiers to make sure it was really me. <laughs> and uh, your second question, why did I come to, to Georgetown? Well, 
A, it was serious. I was concerned about it. As Dr. Carroll knows, I had an uncle who, my favorite uncle, as a matter of fact, who died from esophageal cancer in the late 1970s uh, when the procedures that are used now were not available. Dr. Carroll was explaining to me that, that the procedure that he used was relatively new um, um, and, uh, and extremely effective. And I, I know what my uncle went through. And so it, it, uh, it rattled my cage when uh, I read that. And I talked to my primary care provider who also is a good friend. And uh, I said, look, I, I need to find somebody who has expertise in this. I don't want to, it's not disparaging uh, folks in private practice in the least, but I said, this is serious. And if it's serious, you wanna to go to the experts. Yeah. You don't wanna mess around with it. And um, he recommended that I get in touch uh, uh, with the folks at Georgetown and uh, Dr. Carroll reached out and, uh, um, and frankly, I learned a lot of what I've heard today. That's great, that's great. And can you talk a little bit about your experience with the care that you did receive from Georgetown? Um, yeah, but I wanna put that in a little bit of context um, because I'm a healthcare lawyer and I'm, I represent providers hospitals and, and institutional providers. I did that for 40 years before I started teaching healthcare law. The point is that I've been around in institutions that provide healthcare from a lot of different perspectives, primarily because you don't call the lawyer unless you got a problem when there have been problems. And uh, so I go and I'm always observing because I want to find things that I can incorporate in my healthcare compliance class. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to tell you that I have uh, been incredibly impressed. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are technicians and scientists that, that are extraordinarily good at what they're doing, but what they, they often lack is that thing that marries the technical knowledge mm -hmm. with the patient-centered human component. Mm. And it, you know, it, it's, I don't mean to embarrass you, Dr. Carroll, but it's a, it may be, it may seem like a little thing, but when he walked in the operating room, he always puts his right hand on my left shoulder. <laughs> That's how I know he's there. Yeah. But there's more to it than that. And it, you know, it's Dr. Carroll, but it's the whole team. I mean, I, I jokingly tell people how many people get to be on a first name basis with their anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I've said that they ought to take a picture of Doug and stick it in the lobby next to St. Agnes, the patron saint of uh, nurses as a modern day illustration of somebody who's doing something very technical, but is it very focused on making the patient comfortable. Um, and that, it, I can't say enough good things, but you probably got that impression. Wow, that's great to hear. Yeah, that's we. I've done a lot of these Facebook lives, and that's always you know a big message that is good to hear, and that people you know patients want to feel that way with their providers, and um, you know it's great that you had that experience and have that um, you know provide a uh, type of care given to you. So. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, going back to surgery, um, Dr. Jackson, what is the recovery like once the surgery is over? Um, and what should people you know, expect from their symptoms and um, once, once they've had the surgery? Great question, thank you. Uh, once you, are, you confirm the diagnosis through Dr. Nosarino and Dr. Carroll, and you are, uh, we're then going to proceed with an operation. We will um, take you through the whole step. You show up on the day of operation. You don't need to go ahead of time. You just come in the, on the day of the operation. And you'll go to the operating room and drift off to sleep. Uh, we then will make a couple of little incisions in your abdomen and then inflate your abdomen like a little balloon uh, in order to put other instruments in and the camera in so we can do all this stuff. And then we suck all that air back out so it collapses it back down. Um, and then we wake you back up. 
uh, depending on which operation and whether or not you have a large hiatal hernia or no hiatal hernia, the operation could be an hour to two, sometimes three, depending on the size of the hernia if you have a very large hernia. Um, if you happen to be the first operation of the day, the first case that we do that day, um, sometimes people will go home the same day um, for uh, the magnetic sphincter augmentation that beads with the magnets around mm -hmm. the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, those people generally almost always go home the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, laparoscopic Nissen fundoblications, the wrapping of the stomach around the bottom of the esophagus, most of those people um, stay overnight, although if you're done first time thing in the day, you, you, some people go home the same day. Um, you don't feel great for, for the next couple of days. You have some soreness, uh, sometimes some shoulder pain. And that shoulder pain is because the diaphragm uh, uh, is innervated by nerves that enter the neck, the same place the shoulder nerves enter the neck. Right. And so irritation of the diaphragm your brain mistakes for irritation of the shoulder because it's the same nerve roots. And so people often say like, what happened to my shoulder? I thought my esophagus was the, yeah. the problem was in my abdomen, but it, that goes away. It's really just because of stretch of the diaphragm from that gas that we put in to make it so that we can do stuff in the inside. That goes away after about 48 hours. Um, the, the great thing about this operation though is people know the next day whether or not they're fixed. Mm. Most patients who are Nissens who stay overnight say it was the first night in years that I was able to sleep flat in the bed with no reflux. You know, like that night, it like, yeah. uh, and, and sleeping in the hospital is not always easy, right? You're not in your own bed. There's like, a, you know, people coming in and saying, how are you? And it, it's not always the most restful sleep, but people still say I slept better than I've slept in years because I didn't have reflux last night. I mean, it, it, it fixes it basically almost immediately. Um, wow, that's amazing. The, we generally put people on a couple, on, on a little bit of, on liquids for a little while. And, okay. and that's because the whole area gets a little bit swollen. And the analogy I give is if we were going to operate on your wrist, your wrist would get swollen and you wouldn't go play tennis the next day. Right. But, but swallowing is kind of like tennis for the esophagus, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's function and it's, and so it's trying to get it to swallow. And if it gets swollen, you don't want a big piece of meat going down your esophagus and not being able to get through the swollen area. So we put people on liquids for usually two weeks as we let that swelling go back down so that it can squeeze and move a piece of meat through. It, it, it's wide open. It just mm -hmm. sometimes gets a little bit swollen. Okay. Therefore, uh, people will sometimes lose a, a couple of pounds because they're on a liquid diet rather than a solid diet. Right. Um, uh, but in general, after sort of, if we do this on a Thursday or a Friday, they sort of are, are uh, you know, hanging out, doing a little bit more, um, you know, uh, streaming uh, services uh, uh, on, on the television for the weekend. Um, and then they're sort of back to being themselves, a little bit of shoulder discomfort and, and on liquids, but up and moving around. And then is there like any, you know, follow-ups that they have to do a certain amount of time afterwards or what's that like? People come back to my office at the two week mark. And the reason for that is really twofold because I know that if any problem is gonna pop up, it's gonna pop up in the first two weeks. So right. they know that if it's an urgent problem, they can call me and mm -hmm. then they know they're gonna see me anyway. And so if they feel like it's not urgent and they wanna just, hey, hey by the way, you know, uh, let's take a look at this incision, make sure it's healing nicely. Um, that's at the two week mark. And it's also at the two week mark that we advance their diet from the liquids to, solid food. And, and really, I tell them there's only three rules uh, that they should follow is one is just take small bites of food two chew your food really well. Right? And then three, just eat slowly, because this whole area, it, the swelling is still going down. But people know immediately it's, it's these are really fun post-op visits because you walk back in and they say, you have fixed my problem. Right. I'm not even sure why I had to come back to because I know you fixed me. Like, <laughs> it, it's very, very rewarding because people know immediately. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure it is very rewarding. Um, so Dr. Carroll, is there anything people can do to prevent GERD um, and Barrett's esophagus? Uh, 
No, there's nothing they can do to prevent Barrett's. Again, that's sort of in the DNA of, of why some people get precancer changes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing uh, nothing we can do to alter that. I, I think we kind of, we, we probably uh, glanced over Mr. Harkin's case, didn't really just explain it, but so he had, he's one of the few, um, and he was on his way to a full bone esophageal cancer. He's in that first sentence, more common in white men for some reason, where his reflux caused precancer damage and he advanced on that cellular change right up to becoming a cancer. Mm -hmm. We now have this fairly new technology last you know, 10, 15 years. We can come in endoscopically, burn off the Barrett's and it's replaced with healthy cells. Before that though, and this is not too long ago. I mean, when I was a first attendee and resident, we would just as GI doctors just watch and kind of cross our fingers. When they, if the patients that had the true cancer change and Mr. Harkins developed them, we then sent them to Dr. Jackson for a really big operation to take out part of the stomach and esophagus and pull it. It's a huge operation um, because at that point, cancer was so inevitable that that surgery was recommended as a standard of care. So it's been an enormous game changer in, in that regard. So we, we have so many patients like Mr. Harkins who we can keep them cancer free and save them esophagectomies. And that, that, that's been fantastic. And really, if we you know, no one should get esophageal cancer any longer, really, if they have heartburn symptoms. If they see their doctor and, and see us and we stay on top of it, really no one should get cancer. The mm -hmm. trouble is that two things, many people maybe with less access to care may just take antacids and, and, and not do anything. And, right. and then also when they're 60, 70, they can't eat because they have a tumor and, and, and that's one arm. The others are half the people have no symptoms. And so um, almost half the people with Barrett's and reflux and the cancer have no heartburn. So those are the two qualities make it challenging for, but people with heartburn, if they can seek care, see the right doctors, they should really never get um, esophageal cancer. So we can't prevent reflux and Barrett's, but we can not prevent cancer with, with senior doctors. Right, yeah. And yeah, I, I think about what you said, Mal, you know, when you were telling your story, how, you know, you had heartburn, you're like, I, that's everybody, a lot of people have heartburn, I'm just gonna take some Tums. And, but like you said, you never really know, and it could, you know, progressively get worse over time. And that's when you need, you know, know you need to seek help. Um, to, to state what John just said in another way um, that people need to hear is if you have reflux, it's not your fault. Right. You didn't cause a problem. If you get Barrett's, it's not your fault. You didn't cause the problem. It is something that we need to address, but you, there, there is nothing you could have done that would have prevented this from happening or you, nothing you did that made it happen. It is, it just happens. And just deciding that you're going to do something about it is the step that's important. But don't, uh, don't put it on yourself as if there, there was something that you could have done to like make this not happen. It's, it's, it's not under your control. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's definitely an important thing to, to, to remember. What, to feed off what Dr. Jackson said and Mr. Harkins said, you know, Mr. Harkins said, I have, have, have GERD, everyone has it. So some people don't even mention their doctor. It's sort of a, yeah. It doesn't come up. And so it's so important to venture to your doctor so you can refer for an endoscopy and make sure you're okay. And so, um, but I see many patients where you really have to dig and ask some questions than to even mention they have heartburn. It's to sort of take their thumbs and, and don't even think anything of it. So that, that's, uh, that's an important part of the message too. Yeah, well, and that kind of even connects to my next question was gonna be, when should I see a gastroenterologist for my symptoms? And then I was also gonna ask, you know, how do you start out? So it sounds like you would start by mentioning symptoms or whatever to a um, primary care provider, would that be what you guys recommend as the first step? For sure, it's really age. If you really want to, if you're under 40, it, it's you know probably even too soon in a way, um, but when you're over 40 for sure, uh, that's when you should be referred for an endoscopy uh, to look and see if there's any damage at all. Or if you have symptoms that are uncontrolled prior to that, certainly. But age is the main thing in terms of Barrett's and pre-cancer damage. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Nosarino, are there any new um, technologies you use to diagnose acid reflux and, you know, the associated conditions? Yeah, so today we talked about um, the two pH testing we offer, the wireless Bravo and the pH impedance, mm -hmm. and that is just to objectively diagnose GERD. But another important aspect um, in terms of GERD workup is a motility testing. Um, so motility of the esophagus basically refers to how the muscles in your esophagus move to bring food down your esophagus and also to clear acid reflux. And then it also has to do with what we talked about, the lower esophageal sphincter and whether it's 
opening appropriately. Sometimes if it's too tight, food can get stuck, or if it's just wide open, that can predispose to acid reflux. Um, so in patients who have refractory symptoms of acid reflux that aren't getting better, or before they consider anti-reflux surgery, it's really important to check on the motility of the esophagus to make sure that, again, that the muscles in the esophagus are working appropriately and that the sphincter is opening appropriately. Um, and the reason is, especially before surgery, is like when you're doing the wrap, as Dr. Jackson described, if you do a wrap and your muscles are kind of weak, you can end up with symptoms of trouble swallowing. So again, this is important to look at. So we have a new device that's called EndoFlip, and this doesn't measure acid reflux, but it measures the motility of the esophagus. So um, historically, we use what's called a high-resolution manometry to measure esophageal motility. And this is basically when we take a catheter with sensors, um, you're awake during the study, um, we place it in your nose and move down to your esophagus, um, and we have you drink water. And then we're able to get information about how the muscles in your esophagus are working based on all these sensors that are in your esophagus. But the new technology we have is called EndoFlip, and it's basically a way to measure the motility of your esophagus and the sphincter during a sedated um, endoscopy. So again, the patient's completely asleep, um, they're sedated, and we take a catheter with sensors and balloon, um, and we slowly inflate the balloon in the esophagus and inflating the balloon almost acts as like there's a food bolus in the esophagus and that should stimulate contractions in the esophagus and it should also cause that sphincter to open. So again, during an endoscopy, we can get a lot of information about the motility of the esophagus. So this is a new technology we have at Georgetown that we're using. Great, thank you. That sounds awesome. Thanks for explaining that. Um, Dr. Carroll, Dr. Jackson, it seems like you guys dropped off for a second, but you pop back up at the perfect time because it's time for our wrap up question. Um, so my first one for you guys is why should someone come um, seek care from MedStar Georgetown? Um, Dr. Carroll, if you want to start and then if anybody wants to chime in, you guys can go ahead. Uh, I mean, I think we just, you know, like we said before, we, we an academic place, we tend to subspecialize in just neural parts of the body and we all work just in the esophagus and um, like Dr. Hark, Mr. Harkin said, you know, the, the doctors and prior practice are fantastic, but with some of these issues, they don't have a lot of technology for, uh, you know, managing or, or testing the difficult heartburn patients, getting rid of the precancer damage. So we have both an interest in it and, and expertise and, and some of the unique problems with reflux and uh, that's a good reason. Yeah. And I, then, I, I, the, the thing I would add is that we work as a team. Right. That, that a lot of uh, places in, in private practice, you have one pr provider over here or another provider over there. Um, Dr. Nosarino, Dr. Carroll, I, and some of the other uh, physicians, we all work as one, what I'll call multidisciplinary team, meaning we have different training and therefore approach it and sort of think about it from a different perspective, but we communicate and in fact have regular meetings of this team including radiologists and pathologists. And so putting together people who have expertise in this area that all sit down and talk about different patients and challenges that that individual patient is facing and really tailor the care to that individual patient. That has been proven in multiple different um, diseases, this one included, to be the most effective way to find the right care that's tailored to that patient. Because you may go to one doctor and, and that doctor has a different, has a specific opinion about, about this, right? But you go, you, instead of going to like eight different people, you get the benefit of going, of getting eight different opinions, but only going to one office mm -hmm. because Dr. Nosarino and Dr. Carroll and others will we'll all talk regularly about that individual patient and say, okay, here's what their manometry showed. And here's what their pH showed. Here's what they're complaining of. And here's uh, how they have experienced their GERD. What do we think? And then Dr. Rona Serino says, you know, I think we'd, I'd want to do this test before I say go to surgery. And, oh, well, I think that makes, you know, I say then, well, then I'm, I think that makes sense. John, what would you, Dr. Carroll, what would you do? Is there anything else you think we add, add in? Oh, well, have you thought about this? It, it allows people to get multiple opinions from multiple experts without having to do the legwork right. and really experts in the field, right? So it, that multidisciplinary, I, I think, is, is one of the keys to, to, the, to the care that we provide. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's a super important approach to patient care and 
Um, like you said, you all come and discuss together and you come with different views and, you know, you know, someone's looking at it from a different angle. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's a really important way to look at it. What, what do they say? Teamwork makes the dream work. So there you go. Um, uh, Dr. Nosarino, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, really just to echo what Dr. Jackson said, um, we all work so closely together. Um, we have monthly esophageal conferences where we have experts, radiologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, everyone, where we present all the data and work together. So we are all putting our heads together and figuring out what the best solution is for a patient. So I think that's really unique. Um, and that's why patients should come to Georgetown Academic Center where they can get all the expertise. Great, thank you so much. and. Our last question is for you, Mal. Um, you know, this is a question we like to wrap all of our broadcasts up with. What is the message you want um, people who are watching this broadcast to take away? Um, you know, people who are suffering with Barrett's esophagus or other, you know, GERD or other uh, um, gastroestrophical reflux disease, um, or just people who are watching just to, to learn a, a thing or two. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, still can't hear you. You're still on mute now. How's that? There we go. Oh, sorry, I said the dogs were barking. Oh, that's okay. Uh, um, I, I'd make two points and I'd build on something that Dr. Jackson said, uh, it's not your fault but it's also not normal to be having the level of heartburn that I was having where it was debilitating and it was incredibly frequent, uh, multiple days in a, in a given week. And if you've got either one of those things, um, do something about it. Don't do what I did and, and think it's normal and wait. In fact, uh, my now retired, um, a uh, gastroenterologist only found out about it because uh, we were at a party and he saw me doing this and said something to me about it. And, uh, you know, in, in, in a very nice way said, don't be dumb, come see me. Uh, you know, so don't wait. Uh, and uh, the second thing is if it's serious enough that you need to talk to somebody about it. Uh, you know, we have a rule in, in our house. If, if it's serious, go to the experts. You want people to deal with this all the time um, and who are, realize that it's serious and are gonna take you seriously and not just as a run of the mill problem. And I, you know, I was really fortunate that uh, I got to, uh, to Georgetown to have this taken care of. And, uh, and I guess maybe there's a third point. Um, as I sat here listening to a lot of the, the technical stuff, I, I'm, I'm kind of geeky about that. So I love that. But, uh, but that having been said, um, it was easy. Don't be afraid of it. It was easy. They made it easy. Uh, and they put me very much at ease. Uh, which is not something that's easy to do, by the way. But um, that's the other reason to go to Georgetown. Oh, well, thank you so much. I think that's the perfect way to wrap up this broadcast. Thank you all again for joining us. And like I said, taking time out of your day to answer our questions. Um, and thank you to our viewers for tuning in. If you would like to learn more information or schedule a consultation with one of our experts, please call 202 2950570. We'll also post that phone number in the comments. Um, thank you again, and we will see you next time.